are starting a new series here today, which as you see by the title, is called Taking Every Thought Captive. We are going to talk about fighting. We're going to talk about war. We're going to talk about battles. We're going to talk about a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, which this whole series is based on. But before I get to the biblical part, the, the, the part that we're going to see from St. Paul's writings, I want to give you the main point of this entire series up front. We're going to spend four weeks talking about this concept of taking every thought captive because of this main idea. Read it with me all together. Life's greatest battles are won or lost in our mind. Again, life's greatest battles are won or lost in our mind. You agree with this or you disagree with this sentence? Anyone know what it's like to have a battle in their mind? Anyone know what it's like to have a war going on up there when everything else may look peaceful on the outside? No one may notice anything, but in here, it's a battle and it's a war. I guarantee you, you may not be a soldier, you may never be in the military, but you are every single day that you wake up, you step onto a battlefield, and it's a battlefield in our minds. Let me tell you how this might look like. For some of us, this may look like a battle of inadequacy. Thoughts of, I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I never have been good enough. I wasn't good enough for my parents. Okay, I was, I, my wife tells me every day how I'm not good enough for her. And even my kids, even my kids don't respect me. So you know what, Father Anthony, it's great that all those wor- wor- verses about God loves me. We just sang that song about he loves us, he loves us. But it's really hard to believe when God seems to be the only one. Battle of the mind. How about maybe your thoughts are a battle around some kind of addiction? or some kind of addictive habit or bad habit. And for you, you know how destructive this habit is. You know that every time you get into that, you know what it does to you. You know, you know, you know, you know, you're never going to do it. You promised it. You written on on the the whiteboard or on your desk. I'm never. But then what happens, once those thoughts come, it's like an avalanche. It's an avalanche that hits you, and then all of a sudden, it's, I can't. I'm too stressed. I need a break. I can't take it. I'm going to quit. I'm telling you, those battles are won or lost in your mind before the temptation even hits you. Maybe your battle is a battle of fear versus faith. Fear versus faith. I know I'm supposed to be faith. I know the sermons. I read the Bible verses. But you know what? As much as I want to trust God, tell me, I'm not the only one who thinks this. I'm, as much as I want to trust God, here's the problem. Is there's all those verses. I know enough of those verses. I don't know a lot of the Bible, but I know enough that talk about like suffering for God's children and trials. So like, I want to trust God. But what if I do and I end up in those suffering verses? And what if God messes up? And what if God doesn't do it the right way? And how about this one? How can I trust God after fill in the blank? Because every one of us has things that we can fill in that blank. After what happened to my mom? After what happened to my sister? After what happened to me? After what I'm, how can I trust God after blank? For me personally, how this kind of manifests itself for me. I know I stand up here and I look very confident and I look like the most self-confident, most secure, most whatever it may be. But the truth is, in here, I've had a lot of fears, a lot of thoughts about fear of failure. That's my thing. And my thing is that I don't want to let people down. I don't want to let the church down. I don't want to let my family down. I don't want to let God down. There's a lot of people that look up to you when you're a priest. Like, just let me let you in a little behind the curtain right here. When you walk around dressed like this, Okay, people automatically assume a certain thing about you. I, I have people ask me all the time, what are you, man of God? What? I had one time a kid come and ask me, say, hey, are you Jesus? <laughs> and I'm like, kid, you think Jesus would have attacked that buffet line the way? It is? <laughs> For those who were last week, okay? But my point is, is there's pressure there. And there's a fear of failure. And sometimes I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I, if I can live up to it. Because if I mess up, then it's like, so like I used to work before I was a priest, I used to work at a grocery store, okay? And I was like uh, the, the bag boy and carry people's stuff to the cart. And, uh, the easy job. If I mess up at, at the Super Fresh, people just go next door to the Kroger and everyone's fine. Like nothing really happens. But as a priest, if you mess this up, people like walk out of the kingdom. And that's like eternal stuff. So that's a lot of pressure. And sometimes I think to myself, I'm just being very honest. I think to myself that, you know what? I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Definitely not spiritual enough. I'm not holy enough. So there's thoughts in my head say, you know what? I've seen a lot of people start this job and start on this path and then fall. I'm like, you know what? Just quit while you're ahead. Just quit while you're ahead. Just go early retirement. You did good. Just quit while you're ahead. And I know that on a regular basis, I have learned, I have to battle those thoughts. Because you know what happens if I don't? If I let those thoughts in there, then the Father Anthony that you're going to see on Sunday is not going to be a very bold Father Anthony. He's going to be timid. And should we do that? Well, I'm not sure. And play it safe. And don't take that risk. 
But the only way that I can do what God called me to do is I have to fight those thoughts. Because here's what I learned. And science will agree. We're going to talk about some science a little bit here as well. Science will agree with what the scripture says, which all of our experience knows, which is this, that our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. In other words, what we tend to think comes out one way or the other. What we think comes out one way or the other. I'll tell you how this may play out. Let's say you're married, and you get a negative thought about your spouse. And that negative thought is, he's too controlling. She's too overbearing. She's just like my mom. He's just like my dad, whatever it may be. And then something small happens. And something small happens because you're married. Something small happens every day. But then the problem is not the thing, because if it's just the thing that happened, we can solve the thing. But the problem is... The thoughts. Because what happens in here? Then all of a sudden is, oh, my mom was right. I shouldn't have married him. Oh, my dad was right. She's just like her mother. Oh, the horoscope is right. I should have listened to that fortune cookie. And all of a sudden, something very small, all of a sudden becomes very big, very big, very big. Why? Because of our thoughts. I'll give you another one. Let's say you are a good person. You're a likable person. You're a lovable person. Everyone who knows you loves you. And everyone who meets you is like, this person's great. But you in your mind, you don't feel like you're a good person. You don't feel like you're a lovable, attractive person. Then all of a sudden, someone comes and says, hey, shows a little interest in you. Whether it invites you out, or just maybe a little flirt here, maybe whatever. And then all of a sudden, you start to think to yourself, oh, but once they get to know me, they're not going to be interested in me. I'm sure of it. So why even bother? Why ask her out? She, once she gets to know me, she's not going to be interested in me. Why it's going on a date? Like, why, why should I? As soon as they get to know me, they're not going to like me. The battle is in the thoughts. You may be missing out on opportunities. Maybe you have negative thoughts about the world. That's a very common one these days. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. The world's such an evil place. There's no good out there. Everyone is evil. Everything is evil. Ah! So you know what's going to happen to you? What you're going to do is, first of all, you're going to miss out on a lot of good out there. Because there's a lot of good people in this world. And there's a lot of good that happens in this world. It's just not, it doesn't make the news. It's not the things that make people click. But you're going to miss out on all that. Because I guarantee you it's taking place because I see it with my own eyes. Then number two, what you're going to do, if this is what's in your thoughts, you're going to just basically say, bring my family, bring my kids, dig a hole in the ground, and let's just bunker down, hunker down till the second coming. And you are going to live in fear for the rest of your life. Because in the end, your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Scripture said it this way, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So based on that, let me ask you a question. You, ask, you analyze yourself right now. What characterizes your thoughts? What are the strongest thoughts that are in your head? If our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts, what direction is your life moving in? Where does the road lead to? And then this next question, the run after that is, are you happy with that? Are you happy with that direction? Do you like the direction that your life is moving in? Is your life, okay, let's just kind of go with some extremes right here. Are you headed in the direction of worry and fear and anxiety? Are those your thoughts? Or is yours are peace and calm and trust? Are you the kind of person that automatically you hear of anything bad happening, any disease, any illness, and you're like, for sure, I'm going to get that, or my kids are going to get that, or I already have that? Like, is that you? Automatically assume the worst? Are you someone who believes the best? Are you someone who is characterized by more worldliness in your thoughts or eternalness in your thoughts? Are your, is your thoughts more negative about others or more positive about others? I'm telling you that what's in here is going to come out here because you are always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. It said it another way. I read a nice quote. It said, today's thoughts add up to tomorrow's problems. That's a nice way of saying that. Today's thoughts add up to tomorrow's problems. So you ask yourself, based on what's in there, do you like the direction that you're going, that your family's going, that your relationships are going, that your spiritual life is going? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says this. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test 
the spirits. We're going to substitute there instead of spirit. We're going to say thoughts, okay? But sim similar concept. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I cannot tell you the number of people recently that have come in front of me, great people, people with all kinds of potential, but I see them suffering the battle of the thoughts. And I'm going to use a word right here that I, I don't generally use this kind of word, but I, I believe this. You know how, like in the Bible, you read about demon possession. People were demon possessed, demon possessed, demon possessed. Then you say, well, that doesn't happen anymore. You don't see people who are demon possessed. And I agree. I'm not saying I've seen demon possessed. But you know there's a difference between demon possessed versus demon oppressed. And that's what I see today. I don't see people foaming at the mouth. I don't see people who are speaking gibberish, demon possessed. But I 100% see people who are demon oppressed. And demons are battling them and demons are fighting them. And it's always in their thoughts. Demons giving people thoughts of everyone is against you. No one is on your side. No one understands. I actually had a 16-year-old girl recently tell me, I can't trust anyone in life. And I'm like, but you're 16. You got the best parents. You have so many friends. But these are the thoughts that you can't trust anybody. That no one understands. You got to figure it out yourself. Or I've seen people who have the thoughts, the, 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 the demon oppression of you're never going to get past this problem. You're going to live this way for the rest. You're going to live and you're going to die in this problem. You're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. And even God himself can't solve you. Or the classic. If God really loved you, then. You heard that thought before? I see people who I said, demon oppressed. Everything in life. If God really loved you, then. If God really loved you, then. And it's heartbreaking to see. And I believe, start of this series, that is not the will of God for your life. That is not the will of God for your life. To be oppressed by those demons. That is not. God wants to set you free. And I believe and I am praying with all my heart that God would use these next four weeks to free us from the prison and the captivity that so many people are suffering in today. We're going to look at words from scripture written by St. Paul. And we're going to see that St. Paul, more than any other biblical author, spoke about the battle of the mind. And he's actually the same guy, in case you don't know who he is. He's the same guy. We're not going to read this passage, but he's the same guy who once famously wrote that said, me, talking about himself, he's saying, I'm a good guy, and I'm a saint guy, and I'm a preach guy, but I got lots of problems. And he's saying, the things that I want to do, I can't seem to do those things. And the things that I hate, that's what I practice all the time. So St. Paul is reaching out and saying, I'm struggling. I can't figure out why I'm doing this. I can't figure out why I'm constantly pulled in this direction to go over here. And even though I'm saying I want to go there, I'm constantly pulled here. And I try, and this is why we all feel. So St. Paul, we can relate to this. And we're going to see St. Paul found a solution of how we can break free from the, that prison in our mind, regardless of what it may be. We're going to see a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read three verses, and it's going to give us two action items. Three verses, two action items. And the action items are going to be one offensive and one defensive. I'm a sports guy. If you're a sports person, you know, if you want to win the game, you need to have an offense and have a defense. Okay, so I'm playing soccer right here. I got to protect my goal from you scoring, but that's not enough. So if I have the best defense and I never let you score, but I never play offense, at best I'll tie. But I need a good defense to stop you from attacking me, and then I need offense to attack you. We're going to start with the defense, then we'll go to the offense. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning fleshly, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Again, the weapons of our warfare are not like the weapons out there. So we are in a battle in here. And we're going to use special weapons to win this battle. Because ours are mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds. First, we need to define what's a stronghold. The word stronghold is a military term that would have been very familiar to the people in the first century audience that St. Paul wrote to. And a, a, a stronghold was often like a military, like a fortress. But it was usually hidden inside the city itself. So it wasn't out in the middle of nowhere. So basically what it was, if we're here in this city, all right, and we want to protect ourselves, we don't know people are going to attack us at any time, we're going to build this stronghold over here, 
and it's going to be very strong, as the name implies, going to have high uh, a, a protection, and it's going to be hidden so that people can't really see it. Why? Two reasons. Number one is that people weren't attacked. This is a quick place that the officials could hide in, a secure place, okay? The palace is obviously very open, very... So this is a place you could quickly sneak into, but it was also a place, this is important, it was also a place that they would keep prisoners, like a dungeon. It was a place, because it was a place that was often hidden. So if you wanted to, like if I capture the king of whatever it may be, and I wanted to keep him, I might put him in the stronghold, a hidden place that required special kind of weaponry to invade. And St. Paul, so beautifully, says that is in our minds. In this brain of ours, the devil creates strongholds. He creates secret hidden places that you may not see, that are really hard to get to, that the average weapon won't get to it, won't penetrate it. But he creates them, and he keeps them moving, and they are factories just producing these thoughts. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Then uh, no one loves you, and no one cares about you, and even God himself left you, and he's producing, and he's producing, and you're like, we need to do something about this, but you can't find it because it's a strong, that's what a stronghold means. It means it's a place that's very difficult to attack and even locate. The devil is in there. And what St. Paul says is, we have got to find these strongholds and take them down, because if not, you will end up as a slave to those thoughts. For example, does anybody know someone? Okay, we won't talk about ourselves. But do you know someone? Strongholds in their mind, believing the lies, living a certain way, even though the truth is very obvious to everyone else. Do you know anybody? Does anybody know a girl who is beautiful but thinks she's fat and ugly? Does anyone know a guy who has the opposite problem, who is fat and ugly but thinks he's hot stuff? Okay? <laughs> I wear that shirt a little too tight for everyone's comfort. Okay? Okay? On a more serious note, okay? Does anybody know someone, I know many, who, like I said earlier, are the most lovable people, but feel so unworthy of love? Does anyone know someone who's got it all, but feels like they have nothing? What is that? That's slavery. That's what the devil wants. He doesn't want you to realize that you have it all. He doesn't want you to realize that you have people who love you, he doesn't want you to realize that this doesn't have to be how it works out. He doesn't want you to realize that. That's slavery. That's, again, not demon possession, but demon oppression. Anyone who knows anything about military? The most bloodiest wars are not from other countries attacking you. It's always the civil war, right? It's always from the within. So what the devil does, he doesn't stand over there and shoot arrows over the wall. He infiltrates from the inside, and he sneaks in there, and he first just kind of, and then eventually he pops his head out a little bit more, and then once we don't realize he's there, he starts flexing, and he's just right there. Hit you on top of the head every single time. Well, according to St. Paul, we have special weapons to combat that. Not carnal weapons, but our weapons are mighty in God. And we're going to see what those weapons are. First, we're going to take the defensive weapon, then we'll go with the offensive weapon. The defensive weapon is this. I must identify the biggest stronghold holding me back. Identify the biggest stronghold holding me back. Identify where the attack is coming from. Identify where those arrows are being shot from. What is the strongest or the biggest stronghold that is holding you back in life right now? What lies that that's imprisoning you? You can't defeat what you don't define. And you can't heal what you don't reveal. Thank you very much. I agree. <laughs> you can't defeat what you don't define. And you can't heal what you aren't willing to reveal. So ask yourself, what is that stronghold? What is that thought? Again, I'm always going to battle with this. I'm never going to be close to God. I'm never going to be able to hear his voice. No one's ever going to love me. I'm not good at relationships. I've heard this one. I'm not good at relationships. I'll never be good at relationships. Uh, I'm always going to fail. Uh, one time a, a girl told me uh, this guy, and he asked me out, and he's a nice guy, but I said, no, why? She said, because only guys who ask me out are, are, are psychos and weirdos. So because he asked me out, he seems like a nice guy, but he's probably a psycho and a weirdo as well. <laughs> Where's that coming from? You don't realize it. You don't realize it. 
But those thoughts are literally changing the makeup of your brain every time you think them. I'm going to go to a science lesson right now. And this science lesson is courtesy of the great theologians and scientists, the Berenstein Bears. Who remembers the Berenstein Bears? Anyone? Berenstein Bears? Okay. What are the four characters in the bear? Actually, there's five characters, and the eventually they had to remember their names. There was Mama and Papa, very well named. And then the, the kids, brother and sister. And then eventually they had a baby, and the baby had a unique name. No, not, not baby. <laughs> no, the baby was Honey. Okay, they called the baby Honey. But they were just very straightforward. Okay, Mama, Papa, brother, sister, and Honey. Anyway, the Berenstein Bears. Had, it, was like a, it was like a cartoon back in the Stone Ages, okay, for, for those who don't know what that is. And, and I, 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 I might mess up some of the details here because I don't remember this exactly, but I do remember it like it was a lesson that, that I do remember. The mother was taking a wheelbarrow, okay, and she was carrying, hauling a bunch of stuff, whatever that she was hauling, okay. And brother and sister, the kids were with her, and she was hauling it, so they wanted to help. So she said, okay. And they, it was very heavy, and, and they couldn't do it. So they asked her, say, Mom, Mama, okay, how you're able to do that. And she said something to the effect of, the first time you have the wheelbarrow full of stuff and the ground is flat, you have to go very slow and be very careful, okay? But you know what happens when you do that one time and then you take it back? And then you do it a second time and then you take it back? And then you do it a third time and then you take it back? What happens to the ground over time? You start to have a little, like a little tunnel in the ground, okay? A little pathway in the ground. You go over and over and over. And eventually, they're actually, it, 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 the ground opens up in such a way that there's like tire tracks. Think of it like if you've gone sledding, okay, on the snow. The first time the snow is all the same, but the more you go down, then the, the track just kind of, you, you, it becomes harder to go outside the track than it is to go in the track. Is this making sense with everyone? Okay, Berenstein Bears, look it up afterwards. Okay, they'll explain it right there. That's where we get the word in a rut. You know the expression in a rut? In a rut? That's what it means. The rut means that little hole in the ground. So now when Mama Bear comes out with the wheelbarrow, she just goes in this direction, and even if she's here, it's going to pull her back here. And then she tries to get out, it's going to pull her back here. See how this works? Well, did you know that that lesson... It's exactly what happens in our brains. Every time you think a thought, every time you think a thought, you create a neural pathway. You create a little path between two points in your brain. And every time you think it, it gets a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. And eventually, if you think it enough, then that becomes the default pathway. And the same way that Mama Bear tried to go outside, but the path pulled her in. Or the same way that the kid's trying to sled down the hill, the path pulled him in. Your brain, your mind, your thoughts pull you into that. So you got that pathway that says, I'm not good enough. And then you hear a Bible study, no, 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 I'm good enough. And then you, I'm good enough. But that thing pulls you back in. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because see what happened? You went to school. You got a, a B minus. You're not good enough. If you're good enough, you got a B plus. Or, or, or someone uh, says hello to your friends, they didn't, they didn't invite you, you're not good enough. And you fall back into that trap. Every time you think a thought, every time you think a positive or negative, every time you think a thought, it becomes easier to think it again. Which is why this is really important. Because if you are letting those lies, if you are letting those lies, the longer you believe a lie, the harder it will be for you to ever see the truth. So what's the only solution? Only solution I see is very simple. If I got a rut, if I got a path, and I want to get off of that, what I got to do is I got to make a new path. I got to forge a new way. And that gets us to the offensive side. Okay, we're going to continue our passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. St. Paul says that we should be casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then here's our key phrase, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
Say at, repeat after me, bringing every thought into captivity. Again, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is the offensive side. The defense is identify the stronghold. Where's the lie coming from? Now step two is I see that stronghold and I'm going to attack it. I'm not just going to let it sit there. I'm going to attack it and I'm going to fight it. And I'm going to take weapons, and I'm going to smash, and I'm going to kick, and I'm going to claw, and I'm going to fight dirty, I'm going to bite, okay, I'm going to blow the belt, like whatever it takes to get that guy out of here. I heard it said nicely one time, if I was locked into a room, and it was only me and a lion locked into a room, if you are locked in a room, and it's only you and a lion, there's only one of two solutions, only two solutions are possible if I come back after a week. What are the two solutions? Either he's dead, or you're dead. There's no other option. There's no other like, okay, we decided to just, you know, call it a uh, compromise and we say, no, either he's dead or you're dead. Those are the only two options. Same thing with a stronghold. There's no compromise. There's no, nego we don't negotiate with terrorists. Either you have demolished the stronghold or the stronghold has demolished you. There's the only two options. So that's why we got to play offense. This is not a matter of like, I discovered it. Okay, now I'm aware. G.I. Joe and knowing is half the battle. No. I need to attack. I need, need to take every thought into captivity. I need to find that thought. I need to grab it by the head. I need to grab it to the obedience of Christ. And I need to smash it in front of the foot of our Lord Jesus Christ. The way we're going to do that, here's your action item. You're going to declare the truth and you're going to walk in that new path. You're going to declare the truth and you're going to walk in that new path. So step one was discover, identify the lie. And with every lie, we're going to now declare the truth, the correct path, and we're going to walk in that. Even though in the beginning, this path is easier, we're going to declare the truth, and we're going to, it might be a difficult at first, but eventually that wheelbarrow will make that right in the same way like it did on the negative side. So let me tell you how this plays out. You come home from work, long day at the office, come home, Everything at the house is going to be crazy when you come home because you got kids. They're crazy. Everyone's crazy. And you just, the, the, your normal path, when you come home, they're crazy. You start yelling. That's the path. I'm hungry. They're crazy. I yell. That's the path. But you're going to pause before you get home. You know that's a dangerous path, and you know where that path ends up. You're going to pause. You're going to say to yourself, first you're going to say a prayer, then you're going to count to ten. If you have teenagers, count to 100. Okay, whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> and you're going to say to yourself, children are a reward from God. Children are a blessing. So you know what? Even though they're crazy, it's my job to help them be less crazy. So if I go in there crazy, that's just going to make the crazy factor even higher. It's my job to lead them and love them, not to yell at them. That's the truth. And then you're going to walk in there, and you're going to be a different person. And that path is going to be, whoa, in the beginning, okay? Because yelling is a lot more fun, okay, as we've discovered, okay? But you're not going to. You're going to try, and it's going to be difficult, and you may fall a few times, but hey, you're going to get better at this path, okay? Because you're going to keep on going. You're going to keep on going. You're not going to be tempted to go on that path. That path is so tempting, but you're not going to walk on it because you don't want. You're going to declare the truth, and you're going to walk in a new path. You, your stronghold is you feel bad about yourself. You feel, like I said, not good enough for whatever it may be. Fill in the blank. And when you do that, you know what leads to over-blanking. Overeating. Over-drinking. Over-clicking. Over-buying. You, know you know what your thing is. You know. I feel bad. I think these thoughts. This is what ends up happening afterwards. Which, of course, once I do that, I think more of those thoughts because now I've proven that I am a failure. You're going to walk a new path. You're going to declare the truth. The truth is this. I'm not a failure. I'm the beloved child of God. That's right. I am the beloved child of God. And no matter what I face, if he's with me, we can get through. No matter what. Even though I failed in the past, I'm not a failure. I'm child of the Most High. And I'm going to start to walk that path. And as I do that, like I said, there's going to be evidence to say, no, you are not. You are a failure. I got a lot more evidence, me personally, that I'm a failure 
then I'm a beloved child of God. If I put all the evidence here, I got a lot on that side. But he said I'm a beloved child of God. So I'm going to walk that way. And it's going to be, but would a beloved child of God go to the fridge, overeat, overdrink? Or a beloved child of God, maybe go outside, take a walk. Would a beloved child of God, he's not feeling good on a, on a, on a Saturday night, hit the bars? Or would he hit Vespers? Would he turn on Netflix and binge himself to death? Or would he maybe open up a sermon? Open up a last week's message in the well. Like, where? I'm going to do, I'm going to declare the truth that this is who I am. And the, if I am that, this is how that person walks. Identify the stronghold. That's the defense. The offense. Declare the truth and walk in that new path. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, transformation of life comes from the renewing of mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For some of us, okay, what does it mean to renew our mind? The word new is in there. So new, that's what a lot of us need. We need out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old, in with the new. How do I get rid of all those old, let's say I had old, my deeply ingrained lies and bad thoughts and I, how do i get rid of those things that are deeply ingrained how do i pick it up and remove it well i got news for you you can't you can't remove anything from your brain but you know what you can do you can't remove but you can replace think of it this way if i had a big bucket here okay a bucket the size of this stage big huge bucket full of so much water and i said it filled to the brim of dirty water okay and what i want to do is i want to get that water out there's two ways, the dumb way and then the right way. The dumb way is, okay, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to turn it over. You're going to be able to pick up a bucket full of that much water? Bucket, and I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to dump it over. You're going to try, and you're going to fail, and you're going to feel like a failure, you're going to feel frustrated. That's how a lot of us are. Stop thinking those thoughts, stop thinking those thoughts. What thoughts? That thoughts. And I've thought it again. You know what's a smarter way? How about if every day I take a rock and I throw that rock inside the bucket? What's going to happen? A little bit of dirty water is going to splash out. And then the next day, another rock. What's going to happen? A little bit more water is going to splash out. And if every day I throw in a rock, I throw in a rock, I throw in a rock, I throw in a rock. Not overnight. That's what we want. We want overnight. But not overnight. You didn't get in the mess overnight. You ain't going to solve it overnight. But if every day I throw in a rock, every day I throw in a rock, every day I throw in a rock, you know what's going to happen over time? I will have renewed my mind. Oh, renewed the bucket. I will have gotten all the bad out. How do I get rid of those lies? Put in truth. But I did that yesterday. Father Anthony didn't do it. Do it again today. But I did that for a whole week. Do it for another week. What's a week? Like I said, you've been believing lies for years. And you want a week? Put truth in. Every time you put in truth. Every time you put in truth. Keep going. It's making a difference. You don't see it, but it is making a difference. I promise you. It's making a difference. So your homework, recap, identify your biggest stronghold and declare the truth and walk in it. What I'm going to challenge you to do this week, I said identify your biggest stronghold, just one, just one. You may have 38 in your mind, but you ain't going to win 38 battles this week. So we're going to go for the big guy, the big bully in the back, the one who's really oppressing me. And we're going to call him out by name. And we're going to bring his kryptonite, which is truth. And we're going to declare it. We are going to walk in it. Because you cannot defeat what you don't define. You cannot heal what you are not willing to reveal. And the answer to the lies is the truth. Now, here's the thing about truth. I'm going to give you a few verses up here on the screen. They're all trying to prove the same point. Is that truth and lies, truth is not a concept. Truth is not a belief. Truth is not a statement. Truth is a person. And what you're going to see is that lies are also a person. Let me give you a few verses. John chapter 8, verse 44. Let's talk about lies first. It says, The devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Lies are not just empty statements. 
They are the devil itself. Because the opposite of the devil, the opposite of the lie is truth. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the lies are the devil. The truth is me. And then John 8, 32, put it all together. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's what we want, to know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. I told you a minute ago, to know the truth, who is the truth is Jesus. So when we know the truth, and we live in the truth, we live in him. And when we live in him, we live free. So let me tell you how this works practically. What we're going to do practically is we're going to take the truth, which, like I said, the truth, he is the truth, and we are going to swim in that truth. We're not just going to sprinkle a little, a pinch of truth. We're going to swim in it. We're going to put it in our ears. We're going to put it in our eyes. We're going to stick it in our nose. We're going to scrub ourselves with that truth, and everywhere we go, we want to be surrounded by truth. We want to live in truth. We want it to be inside us and coming outside of us, and that truth is the word of God. So, for example, you hear, like I said, you hear that thought that says, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'll never be able to do it. Never. You say, no, 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 no. Truth says, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I have him in me, is there anything he can't do? No. So, therefore, the I can't do it. Get that truth. Get that lie out of here. We're going to live inside the truth. You hear something that says, you're not good enough. You never will be good enough. You, you've always been this way from, from when you were young. You say, excuse me, I wasn't made by Kmart. I wasn't made by, by a factory in Kansas somewhere. I was made by the eternal, infinite, everlasting God. He made me. He knit me in my mother's womb. Before he was formed in the womb, he knew me. I was fearfully and wonderfully made. So if you got a problem with the way I was made, you take it up with him. I was made perfect. I don't care what anyone says to me. You hear what I hear all the time, which is you messed up bad. You messed up bad. You messed up bad. I hear that all the time. You messed up bad. You say, you know what? I know I messed up bad. But Psalm 103 says that, you know what? As far as the east is from the west, so far as he moved our transgressions from us. So I know I messed up bad. I don't say that I messed up bad. But I know that he knows my frame. He remembers that I am dust. And he's taken my sins as far as the east is from the west. Bury him in the bottom part of the ocean. So I know I messed up bad. But the truth is that he's forgiven me. I'll never be happy. Never be happy. I'll never be happy. Excuse me? Did you not read in the Psalms that says the joy of the Lord is mine? The joy of the Lord is mine, and in his presence is fullness of joy. So you may say, I'll never be happy, but I know I will be happy. Because if I have him, I have fullness of joy. And lastly, my favorite, I'm all alone. I got no one. No, sir. No, ma'am. You never be alone. Because Jesus has promised that I will not leave you orphans. That lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. In the scripture, there are 31,000. 102 Bible verses. And I promise you, there's one that speaks to your lie. You just got to find it. That's why we read our Bible. And that's why I want to say is, well, that's not just why we read our Bible. Reading the Bible is good, but we need more than read our Bible. If we're going to defeat those strongholds, we need more than read. We need read. We need meditate. We need study. We need memorize. We need discuss. Like, we want to live in the truth. We don't want to just dip our toe in and say, well, that's a nice truth that we, no, we want to live in the truth. We want the truth to be, like I said, oozing out of us. That when someone asks us about it, like the truth comes out here and the truth comes out there and we are just like truth machines and everywhere we go, the truth is just flying out of us. And when every time the devil comes with those lies, we can't hit because we got truth going everywhere. And that's how we're going to identify the strongholds. And we're going to declare the truth and we're going to walk in that new path. Because life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What comes to mind, comes in our mind, comes out our life. But Jesus said, I don't want you to live that way anymore. We have an opportunity to live free. I'm going to give you a verse here from the Old Testament, from Isaiah chapter 61. But it's actually a verse that Jesus quoted in the New Testament. It's actually the first time that he gave like a public sermon. He entered into the synagogue and he started quoting from the scriptures of Isaiah. And this is the passage that he quoted. But I like the Old Testament version. He says this way. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, 
And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. The opening of the prison to those who are bound. He's not talking about people who are on death row. He's not talking about people who are serving 20 to life. He's talking about this prison in here. Recently, I was on an airplane, and when I, when I get on airplanes, that's when I watch movies, okay, because as those, anyone who's flown with me knows, even though I'm a man of God and trust God, I'm a very bad fly- flyer, okay? Everyone sees me, they're like, oh, good, there's a priest on this plane. I'm like, I'm not the guy you want next to you, okay? I'm the guy who's like, what's that sound? What's that? You know, like, that's me. So I collect other people's barf bags just in case I, I need them on mine. But I was watching uh, Mission Impossible, one of the 15 Mission Impossible movies. I love anything with Tom Cruise. I'm a big fan of any kind of those kind of spy movies. And one of the scenes, okay, if you're Mission Impossible fans, you know that there's always like what's happening and there's like 15 layers that are happening which no one really understands, but it's just fun to watch, okay? So there was a guy who was locked in a cage, okay? It was like, the, like the, yeah, like a big cage and he was locked in there and he was gonna be killed essentially. And then, like I said, in Mission Impossible fashion, stuff is always happening. So the lights went out and then like the smoke came or something like that. And then all of a sudden, the lights came back on and everyone was dead. Okay, all the people who were like holding him in thing, everyone was dead. The guy in the prison, okay, was like, you know, didn't realize what had happened. He had like, you know, been out or whatever. So he was kind of coming to, and he kind of sat there in the prison, even though everyone who was holding him there was now dead. And in fact, the door was open. But he didn't realize it. And he sat there for a little bit. Then eventually, kind of came to, picked himself up, and walked out. Can you imagine if he had stayed there? A couple days, a week. Can you imagine if he had just said, you know what, I'm just going to stay here for the rest of my life? And you'd say, why? He'd say, because I'm in prison. He'd say, yeah, but you know the door has been opened. You don't have to be in there anymore. Like, I get it that you're there now. But you know you don't have to. Because somebody came. And he opened the doors. And you can just get up and walk out. And that person, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus. He opened the door. Opening the prison to those who are bound. He made a way. He said very simply, you're imprisoned by lies, I'm truth. Take me. Bring me in the picture. Listen to what I say. Read my word. And then just simply get up and walk right out. Because none of us need to be in prison anymore. I believe God wants to bring freedom to so many people. I really, really believe it. I can't tell you how much, like I said, it's been on my heart. And it's been breaking my heart to see great people oppressed by these demonic thoughts. And I believe God wants to use this series to give us freedom. And if you believe that too, if you believe that too, I got good news for you. We're going to get there, but we're not going to get there just by listening here on Sundays. Sundays are great. Sundays are great for listening, and we get inspired, and we get encouraged. But the real change, the real work happens Monday through Friday. So I'm going to give you some homework. And that homework is these three questions. And like I said earlier, you can find them in the STSA app in the notes section. You can take a picture of it on the screen. I want you to wrestle with these questions this week. Maybe discuss it with your wife or with your husband or with your best friend. Maybe spend a day praying, whatever it is. But I want you to ask yourself these questions. Number one, based on my thoughts, where's my life headed? What is the overwhelming lies that are in the thoughts that are in, sorry, the thoughts that are in my head, what direction is that taking me? Two, What is the biggest stronghold that is holding me back? And then three, what truth demolishes that stronghold? I pray that through this series, that God will give freedom, and I believe with all my heart that God will give freedom. But he might not give it to everyone, but he will give it to those who are willing to put in the work, to do their homework, identify that stronghold, name the truth, and walk in that new path. I hope you're as excited for this series as I am. Let's stand for prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today and 
opening the doors of your church for us, and, and more importantly, opening your, your bosom for us, Lord, opening your arms wide and giving us a chance to, to, to live with you and to live free. Lord, so many people are oppressed by the devil. So much, Lord, of, of lies and, and those strongholds in our head, Lord. We hate them. We hate them, Lord, and we don't want to live that way. We don't want to live that subpar life, Lord, that's not from you. So I really pray that during this series, that you would do a mighty work in our hearts and most of all, Lord, in our minds to feed us the truth and to help us to live in that truth every single day. I pray that through this series, Lord, we would see strongholds being demolished week by week, that strongholds are getting smashed and destroyed and thrown out. And I pray, Lord, that that would all be by your power working inside of us. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Thank you.